everyone. <clears throat> beautiful, beautiful. Wow, just always so grateful for these opportunities that we can share together like this, come together and pour our hearts out and call upon the Spirit to bring us clarity and illumination and just feel a restfulness in our heart, a very much of a peace wash over us and, and abide in us. And so I thought at the beginning of our session today, I thought we would do a, a little music meditation together. Uh, as I mentioned yesterday, Svava has gone into the studio to record 14 songs and um, and basically uh, really given us a gift that came from Jesus. And so I was looking, f really feeling out of an appreciation and a gratitude song. So if you, if you want to close your eyes, uh, beautiful. Also, we have this most beautiful painting of Jesus uh, by the water. I think it's Peter. Uh, coming in. It's by the shore too. So for some of you, you, you really enjoy more of a, of a closed eye meditation and, and connect in deeper that way. Uh, and for some of you, maybe you want to try an open eye uh, meditation with this beautiful painting of uh, Jesus that we got here at the studio from the from uh, Salt Lake City and the, the Mormons down there. It's, a, it's just a beautiful painting. So let's just take a couple deep breaths. And for those of you that want to just open your eyes and do an eye gazing meditation with this painting of Jesus, or if you feel to close your eyes and, and sink deep within, let's start the day this way. Thank you for your faith in 
Oh, beautiful. That's a great way to start. To be as relaxed as you can possibly be, to be as open as you can be, as receptive. Because everything, everything that you would want to know, everything that you would find helpful is is really truly immediately available. And it just is all there for the asking. It has to be what's important in your heart. It has to be the prayer of your heart to come into awareness. You don't need special skills, special abilities, special formulas. Uh, you don't need a, a kind of specialized curriculum to receive this gift. Because it's really the gift of grace, but but you do have to want it. You just have to want it. And that's why some of those course lessons that jump out at you about being determined to see, or above all else I want to see things differently, uh, this wanting is so important. Because really the wanting could be thought of as the prayer of your heart or like your altar. And what is it that you put on your altar? What is it that you want the most? What is it that has the most sacredness, the most reverence, the most importance? That's the altar of your heart. And to the mind that's asleep and dreaming, it, you know, it, it can seem like there's so many things in this world that are important in varying degrees and gradations, but, but actually that peace that passes the understanding of the world, that, that intense happiness and joy of knowing our Source, it really has no other, there is no other to it, there is no rival to it. The ego would like to make up a lot of substitutes and sprinkle our consciousness and our awareness with many things to keep us distracted. But in the end, it's like the song was saying, you are the love of my life, the love of my life. In the end, we do come back to the simplicity of, of singing that to God. You are the love of my life. And if you are uncomfortable with the term God, you can, you can use spirit, you can use uh, anything, higher power, any, any wording that you feel comfortable with, but that is the thing that is the most important thing. And this, as we go into it deeper today, that's what's going to make it readily available to us to live a life under Christ's control. Because when we have a false identity, and we believe that the ego is our reality, then a personal identity, a personality, a, a configuration of family, friends, society, community, uh, this awareness of, of a separate identity takes hold and, and it will stay in our awareness as long as we value keeping it. As long as we believe that it's important to be separate from the whole, separate from the source, then that identity will remain with us. Even if you look around at your environment, the people in your life, the things in your life, your occupation, the, the, the pets that you ha may have, the, the neighborhood in which you live, if there are any aspects of that that you feel uh, are, are not helpful for you, then instead of looking out there and thinking that you need to make that location change, or that, that shift and change in form, really the Spirit is saying, come inside with me and let's just take a look at what you are still valuing and devaluing. What you are still holding up in your mind as something that's more important than the love of God. And we begin to get into the practice of going inside 
and really becoming honest with ourselves about what it is we truly want and what is the state of mind that we truly want and we truly feel worthy of, that we truly deserve, as we focus our attention on that, it will seem that our reflections in, the, in perception do shift and change. And that's, that's part of a, a progression. So what I want to talk about today is the theme of going under Christ's control and coming to that, that beautiful, lovely, open-minded state of mind where you're clueless and carefree and cared for, you know, it will, honestly, it will involve a dismantling of the way you perceive the world right now. So there is going to be some shifting and changing. It's really just shifts and changes in your own mind, but it will seem to play out in terms of, of the world that is being perceived by that sleeping mind. And the key thing, again, will be staying focused on what is it that I truly want, coming back to that, what is it that I truly want, keeping the mind very, very focused. For some of you who have worked with A Course in Miracles, like I have, you know, I, I went through that book and when I was reading the book, I was paying close attention and I would oftentimes just stop when I come to a certain paragraph or a certain sentence and just really take time to really take it in. Like, wow, what is the impact? What are the ramifications of, of this that I'm reading, these ideas that I'm reading? Uh, some of you who have read the, the course, when you get back into the, the manual for teachers, I was just glancing again this morning uh, at the manual for teachers at the back of A Course in Miracles, and I came up upon uh, that section, what are the characteristics of God's teachers? And the very first one is trust. And, and he says, this is the foundation on which their ability to fulfill their function rests. Fulfill their function. If, if our only function is to forgive illusions, to expose darkness, to raise the darkness to the light, to release limiting beliefs, egoic beliefs, so that we, our mind may be returned to that glorious awareness of having no limits, of being a perfect creation of a, of a loving God, then he's even given us stages that we will go through. Some of you are probably quite familiar you know, I was, I was very interested. The first time I went through that section, my eyes were all popped out and I was, I was like taking in every sentence. Oh my gosh, the stages of the development of trust. Oh my gosh, how many are there? Six. Okay, wow, six stages. And then as I read through them, uh, I have to say my initial reaction was, oh my gosh, four of the six are conflictual, uh, challenging, unsettling, uncomfortable. Uh, I, I thought, wow, if you judge the, the level, the stages, the development of trust that you have to do to wake up from this dark dream of separation and death, that even the unwinding from the belief in separation, four of the six are, are I would say, somewhat dark. And so, I like it when, I, when the way shower gives you a roadmap, but also says, listen, I'm going to be realistic with you. <laughs> you know, you've wound yourself into a very dark dream. He says, I, you know, I know because I was there too. <laughs> and I had to, to learn to listen to one voice in my mind. And I had to learn to listen and follow uh, the Holy Spirit to unwind myself from this dark dream, but four of the six uh, stages that you're going to go through are going to be quite uh, difficult. And, um, and then I looked at those and I thought, well, at least when you get towards the end, four, I think it's four and six, there's a, there's a period of rest and respite 
a very restful period there in stage, stage four and then six when you reach your achievement, when you reach your self-realization, when you reach your experience of transfer of training and, and truly forgiving all things that are perceived through the five senses, uh, then you start to tap into this happiness and this peace and this joy in a very consistent way. Of course, the final stage is going to be the breakthrough uh, stage, but that would be the stage that would be the equivalent of being under Christ's control. That's the stage where you're just beholding the world. You're beholding the world in all of its loveliness. A world without judgment, a world without differences, a, a unified world, a, a harmonious world. What's not to like about a unified, harmonious world? If, you want it, if you've ever thought of heaven on earth or the, the most heavenly state that you could experience, and that's, that's the final stage. It's called a period of achievement in the Manual for Teachers. But in order to come to that, it will take faith because the things that you trusted in before, your learning, the learning of the world, you know, we all have had education, we all have had upbringing, we all have had conditioning, and all of this education and upbringing and conditioning, the, the majority of it, I would say the vast majority of it, has been part of a blockage or a hindrance of knowing who we truly are. So, you know, at one point in the Course in Miracles, Jesus says, you've been poorly taught. <laughs> okay, that's, that's pretty direct. I've been poorly taught. Another point, he says, resign now as your own teacher. <laughs> but you've, been, you've been teaching and learning a lot here, and, and it's not been going well. You know, you have not found the freedom that you had hoped for. You had not found that, that happiness that you had longed for. Your teaching and learning was very limited because it was, it was guided by the ego. Uh, you might say in, in the kingdom of heaven or perfect oneness in nirvana, there is no teaching and there is no learning. There is no need. There is no change in the kingdom of heaven. Everything is constantly light, constantly joy and love and happiness. So, so learning is part of an ego invention, and as with everything that the ego invented, the Holy Spirit uses it. So the Holy Spirit is not going to destroy the ego's thought system, because the ego's thought system was believed in by a very powerful mind, the Holy Son of God, and, and love and light and God, eternity, doesn't even know of destruction. So it's not like, oh, there's an invader, intrusion alert, intrusion alert. Our beloved sonship has been invaded by a dark force called the ego. Red alert, red alert. Get the angels, get the, the swarms of angels, the legions of angels to get out there. No, the angels are not a war machine. The angels are just symbols of the Holy Spirit's correction, and God won't destroy what the ego made because God doesn't know of destruction. So, so what do we get? If the ego is not going to be destroyed, and yet it's, it seems to be a death wish, how do you deal with something that's a death wish without destroying it? I know in all of our movies, you know, Star Wars, you know, it's like trying to kill the enemy, kill Darth Vader, or kill the evil one, eradicate, eliminate, destroy. But God doesn't know of destruction, so the most we can say of what love and light does with the Holy Spirit, with the ego, or the death wish, is it's called reinterpretation. That's as harsh as God can go. I mean, God, pure, pure love doesn't even know of error, so the Holy Spirit, which is just a corrective extension for what God doesn't understand, God doesn't understand separation. God could never understand separation because God creates in wholeness. Spirit creates spirit creates spirit. Spirit doesn't even understand separation. But the Holy Spirit, that corrective aspect, 
has one function and that is reinterpretation. So if you're looking for a knight in shining armor, that knight in shining armor <laughs> to save the day is reinterpretation. That's all that we're being asked to do is allow our minds to go through a reinterpretation of the world. It was, it was interpreted through a filter of hatred. It was made out of hate. It's been interpreted through hatred and we've been playing this game of attack and defense and protect the body and protect our children and protect our houses, protect our country. We've been trying to be so protective of certain symbols and every culture is protective of their country, of their, their families, of their land, uh, you know, of, of their homes, of course. But all of that is a projection of the ego because all of it is, is a, a game of attack and defense and it all involves illusions and illusions do not need to be protected or defended in any way, shape or form. As long as our mind is sleeping and identified with these false images, then what it is in need of is reinterpretation. You could call it correction, you can call it reinterpretation. Reinterpreta now some of us were raised with, you know, Christian symbols and we had symbols like salvation, you know, you know, uh, I know going to Bible school and reading the Bible and growing up as a Christian, you know, there was some, some aspects of Christianity that were quite terrifying, like last judgment, you know, as if uh, somehow God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit were going to be involved in some kind of last judgment and it wasn't pretty. Uh, the, the good ones get taken up and uh, the bad ones get burned in the fire. Uh, it, you know, it wasn't something growing up as a child that you were like, oh, that sounds sweet. You didn't, you didn't say it sounded sweet when some are taken up and some are burned. Or some are, you know, some are taken up to, to go back to heaven and, and others as if they're burned for their, their punishing, punishment for their evil ways and everything. You know, that is still so dualistic. All the stories that most all of us were raised with are so dualistic. Always good versus evil and good and the bad and, and even with God and even with Jesus, you know, he'll come back, his second coming, he's going to come on a white horse. That sounds cool. Coming in over the clouds on a white horse, but, you know, he's going to take the good ones up with him uh, and he's going to the, the rest are just going to perish. You know, I mean, that's, that's worse than the Santa Claus story. He sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows if you've been bad or good, so be good for goodness sake. You know, at least, at least Santa Claus was dualistic, but it didn't have like burning people <laughs> that, were, that were perishing, you know. There was none of that in the, in the whole Santa Claus story. So, so for me, once you come to a point and you start to realize that the solution is going to be a reinterpretation, a reinterpretation in your mind, then you have just taken a quantum leap in your spiritual journey to just come to the admission that, that all your mind needs is, is a corrective reinterpretation. And actually, it's really just a tweak, uh, because, because love is so amazing and so beautiful and everything, and distortions are, it's like a little tweak. Uh, Joel Goldsmith, I think, used to call this world is like a parenthesis in eternity. It's just this little tiny tweak of a correction where you, for a moment, have one of these moments where you go, oops, you, you have an oops moment where you realize you had misinvested your, your mind. You had, you had put your great mind energy and your mind's attention in the wrong direction and then you have this oops moment, oops I made a mistake, and then 
you open up and this amazing heavenly correction comes in and you are just so happy and so relieved and so grateful that it was just one little tweak this tweak of believing in time and space, this little tiny little tweak of identifying with, with the body and, and being a person. And it's, it's not some big kind of monumental thing, it's the tiniest little tweak. It, and it's also the simplest thing that you could ever do. I mean, if illusions are illusions, how difficult can it be to turn around and accept the truth? If, if illusions are just misperceptions of reality, if, if illusions are just misperceptions of identity, and if they have no actual validity whatsoever, it cannot be difficult to accept yourself as the Christ. It must be easier to, to ex accept yourself as you really are than to try to pretend you're something else that you're not. It has to be easier. Reality must be a lot easier than what we're going through, what we're experiencing in, in time and space. I remember back in the 1990s, I was so on fire with the Course and so on fire for God and Spirit that I don't know what the people around me even thought of me. I was, I mean, I was so on fire and, and I was so happy that I started to have people showing up uh, that were quite curious about what was going on with me, what was happening. And some of them actually called themselves students and became my first students back in the early 1990s. And and then when they start to join their mind with mine in the same purpose, then the same thing started to happen to them too. Their lives started to shift in, in dramatic kind of ways. And um, even if they would go to a Course in Miracles group, I would say, isn't this wonderful? Go out and share the good news. They go out to a Course group and the people at the Course group would think, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? That sounds like a fairy tale. That's, they would come back to me and they would say, we went to the course group and the course group, we told them what we're going through and, and we are so amazed and they told us that's a fairy tale, that's ridiculous. You know, they were dismissed for the fairy tale quality of the things that they were sharing was happening in their life. They were dismissed. It was almost like, where did you come from? And you know, they almost, people were saying, it's a fairy tale, you know, that, you could go, that just belongs in some kind of fairy tale book. It doesn't, shouldn't be shared at a Course in Miracles meeting. But for me, it was practical Christianity. It was, it was like finally taking those core beautiful teachings from the Bible that Jesus had given us 2,000 years ago and, and why not fully embrace them? Why not live that way? in a world where it's so much based on planning and the future, and Jesus says 2,000 years ago, take no thought for the morrow. You know, what you should wear, what you should eat. I mean, if Jesus had gone into great detail, he, he would, uh, in, in present times, he's like, don't put your mind's energy on your career. To the world, the career is a very serious thing, a very important, serious thing. You notice most of the fairy tales, none of the characters in fairy tales are ever talk about their career. You don't hear Cinderella talking about her career. You know, you don't, you know, all the fairy tales, nobody ever talks about careers. I never hear them talk about household finances, you know, like, or what their investments are, uh, what, what they're doing to prepare for the future. The fairy tales, it's almost completely omitted. You know, you've got some dramas going on, some basic dramas going on in the fairy tale, but a lot of the things that most people struggle with and are so challenged with are omitted from the fairy tales. And the world would say, well, yeah, that's just not practical. That's why they're fairy tales. 
uh, because they're, they're not very practical. They're just like little airy-fairy stories. But I found in my life, when I started to just put spirit first in everything, and I really started to just deeply pray and listen, okay, what would you have me do? Where would you have me go? And I would get these strong guidances and prompts, and then when I would follow them, I, I would have such glorious, expansive experiences, like expansive joy. Follow the next prompt. Woo! Another expansive joy experience. Follow the next prompt. Uh, whoa! Another expansive experience. That pretty soon, I started associating following my guidance with the happiness and expansiveness. At first, it was a little bit like, uh, I don't know if I can just let go of all my past learning here so quickly. That I don't want to be gullible. I don't want to be uh, like stupid. I don't want to, to put myself into a position where I'll have all these regrets like, you should have gone back to all that practical worldly advice that you had spent years learning. I wanted to go into a place where my guidance would lead to an expansion of my mind, my awareness, and that would be the proof. That would be the, all the proof I needed was that expansive, glorious state of mind. And to me, that's what got me in the direction of living under Christ's control. You know, I, at the beginning, I, I wasn't really fond of traveling, but the, the guidance was to travel across the United States for an unspecified amount of time, and I didn't know where I was going to stay, or I wasn't going to visit relatives, I wasn't going to visit friends, and there's a part of my mind thinking, oh, Jesus, holy Jesus, you better, you better know what you're doing here, because you get somebody like David who doesn't like to travel out on the road, traveling every day, and, and going where? You're going to tell me? Uh, and where, where are the funds going to come from? Where is the, okay, uh, thank you for this miraculous car, the three-cylinder car that you got me, but exactly where is the gas going to come from? Where, where will the body sleep? Where will I, where will I, I stay? You know, it's not, this wasn't going out for a couple day trip, a weekend trip. This is like launching out for weeks. I had no idea how long the trip would go. And it was, I can really relate to Helen Schuckman starting to take the course down with those words, this is a course in miracles, please take notes. In 1965, she starts getting this train of thought, this is a course in miracles, please take notes. Of course, she revolted and went to Bill Thedford and said, now it's, now it's gone from colored visions and dreams, now it's, it's, it's speaking to me. And he's like, well, what's it saying? She said, here's what it is, I wrote it down. And basically, that was her, her partner there, her collaborator, because he said, you know, it's, this, isn't, this isn't too bad, this is pretty good stuff. Uh, maybe we should just let it continue. <laughs> tomorrow, and if it's all gibberish, we'll just tear it up and we'll throw it away and we'll pretend it never happened. You know, we won't even acknowledge it. But if it's good stuff, maybe we should pay attention to it. And really, I think all of us are at that point in our lives where it's like we're saying, God, reach me. Spirit, show me the way. If I got to go through some dismantling, then so be it. If I have to have some major forgiveness lessons that I have to face, that's okay. I, I'm willing to go through my forgiveness lessons. I, I want peace of mind. I'm, I'll do whatever it takes. I'll do whatever it takes. You just make it clear and obvious and you show me, you show the way. And for Helen and Bill, starting to take down this inner dictation that Helen was receiving with shorthand and then Bill typing it out so they, they actually got the the text, and then the workbook, and then the manual for teachers, song of prayer, psychotherapy pamphlet, all of it came from about 1965 to 1972, but, 
But they're on a, on a journey, an adventure of even receiving this material because they're research psychologists. You know, this, they can't publish this kind of thing in their journals. Uh, among their peers, they'd be left off the block at Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center if they start uh, publishing this. But, but they both had, I think, a feeling that this was like an answer to their prayer. Somewhere in their heart, they were saying, please help me live a happy life. Please help me find joy. Help me find this peaceful, restful way of living. I just want a peaceful life. I, I don't know exactly what I'm going to have to go through with it, but please help me. And they weren't even using the words like, Lord help me, because these were, these were research psychologists at Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center. And they had pretty wild uh, relationships like most, in most uh, institutions around the world. You know, it, their, their professional life was no bowl of cherries. It was full of tensions and anxieties and stress, like most institutions have uh, and, and most organizations have in the world. Most families, most people, most individuals are dealing with a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety, depression, sometimes suicidal thoughts. You know, it's, it's a death wish. This whole linear time-space cosmos has, has come as a, the result of a death wish. So we shouldn't be surprised that there's suicide, there's destruction, there's, there's depression, there's anxiety, there's, there's fear, guilt, shame, pain. What would you expect from a death wish, you know? What, what else would you expect from a death wish? It's, it's exactly what you would expect from a death wish. And yet there is a way out, a way of bringing your mind into alignment, into attunement with the spirit so that you can find happiness, true happiness, not happiness because you got a promotion or got a brand new car, a new, a new hairstyle, a new set of clothes, a new house, a new car, more money in your bank account. I mean, whatever all the things that ego would say, that's where you get your little bits and pieces of happiness. But those are all distractions away from knowing who you really are. That's the grand surprise. The grand surprise is, is discovering who you really are and have always been. You've been this glorious spirit and you just forgot about it. You had an amnesia, you had a forgetting, you took on a dream, you gave over power in the dream. You know, you, you, weren't, you weren't even experiencing yourself in a lucid dream anymore, aware that you're dreaming. No, you, you got all caught up in playing the roles. You know, like that, we have a movie in our Movie Watcher's Guide to Enlightenment called The Nines, and there's some just great lines in there. You know, you got, the, the blonde woman says, tells the main character, you know, you got all caught up in playing these roles and moving continents around and, and all these wars and the human condition is, is the result of a psychotic break of a break from reality, a break from love and light and oneness. You had a psychotic break and you've had some pretty wild dreams going on there and you are so identified with those dream characters that that is what you call daily life now. You've, you've forgotten eternal life, so now you're, you're all caught up in this mirage of images, which you call daily life, and they don't have anything to do with you at all. It was funny, like, yesterday after the first session, I, I went in to check Facebook, and I love all the little comments that come in, but somebody had commented on, on Spiri. Is everybody aware of, of Spiri, this, this little app that I developed? It's one on Facebook, and now there's an app for your phone called Spiri, where you work through your upsets, and you work through your fears and doubts and perceptions to, so you can have a, a miracle, a change of mind. Anyway, <clears throat> I was reading one of the comments on Spiri, and, and the woman had written, she said, <clears throat> there's a problem with this app because this app doesn't know the difference between facts and, and beliefs. This app cannot tell the difference between facts and beliefs. 
every time I go, I use this app, it's always pointing out uh, the negative beliefs that I have. And I'm telling the app, no, no, this actually happened to me. You don't get it, app. Like, th this really happened to me, really. This is a real thing. This isn't a negative belief, this is a real thing. This is a fact. You know, like that old TV show in the United States years ago from, I think it was the 60s, Dragnet. Just the facts, ma'am. It would, you know, the, the main uh, character, detective. Just the facts, ma'am. We just want the facts. Well, you know, that, I mean, I had to laugh when I saw it because, because she was saying the app has a problem because it can't tell the difference between facts and, and beliefs. It doesn't understand the difference between facts and beliefs. And it reminded me of flashback when I was with this group of students back in the 1990s, like around 1993, I'm with this group of students, a small group of students, very devoted to the course. And one day I go in to meet with them and they've just read a line in A Course in Miracles and they're all upset. They're all upset. And they all, David, tell us what this means. I don't understand what this one line means. And they've been having this big discussion. And the line in A Course in Miracles that they were discussing, they were all riled up about, was, here's the line. No one can be angry at a fact. They didn't like that. They just, they did not like that. No, they said, what is he talking about? What do you mean no one can be angry at a fact? They said, I get, I get angry at the facts. Every day I get angry <laughs> at the facts. And I said, no, no, you don't, you don't understand what a fact is. If, you, if you're angry at a fact, then you must not know what a fact is. Because if you knew what a fact is, then you could not possibly ever get angry if you knew what a fact was. That's what it means. No one can be angry at a fact. So finally, they, they persisted, you know, Oh, David, come on, quit with this talk, and that sounds ridiculous, and da da da. Give us an example. Can you give us, can you give us one example of a fact? Just give me one example of a fact. And I said, yes, I can. God is a fact. And they're like, oh. And can you give us, a, is there another example? Do you have another example? I said, yeah, Christ is a fact. God is a fact and Christ is a fact and no one can be angry at a fact. And if you're angry, you simply don't know the fact of what is. Byron Katie would just call it what is. What is is a fact. It's just a fact. That's the fact of reality, what is. It's what is. It's eternal. It's changeless. It's loving. It's joyful. It's peaceful. It's pure oneness. It's a fact. That's a fact. And no one can be angry at a fact. So I was laughing when I was reading this comment that, that Sperry can't understand the difference between beliefs and facts. And I said, well, that's just because Sperry is aware that there is only the fact of God, of love, of oneness, of perfection, of spirit, and that everything else is a result of a belief. And Spiri is trying to bring those false beliefs up into awareness so they can be seen for what they are and released and forgiven. That's what Spiri is doing. I, I mean, Spiri came from years ago when people were saying, you know, do you have any kind of worksheets or anything? I mean, Byron Katie has got, you know, her four turnaround questions, turn it around, turn it around. Do you have anything at all, David, that, that we can use kind of in a systematic way, other than the course? Can you give us something that we can use in a systematic way to start to release these false perceptions and these false thoughts and beliefs from our mind? And so I made this thing called Instrument for Peace, and it was a 12-step worksheet at what, do you, what, what did you perceive happened, um, and, and it takes you down through your, your perceptions and your thoughts and your feelings and it takes you down to your belief. It takes you down to your core belief of do you want to be right or happy? Do you want to be right about the way that you think the situation happened or would you rather be happy? 
And if you finally go through the whole worksheet and you would rather be happy than write, you'll toss everything <laughs> that you wrote down on the top part of the worksheet because it's more important for you to be happy than to hold on to these thoughts and feelings and beliefs, these mis misperceptions and misinterpretations. So anyway, I did this worksheet and then it, it's now turned into an automated uh, bot on Facebook or a, an app on, uh, for your iPhone. And yet, it's true that it's all it's helping you do is get in touch with what is it that I, that I believe and think and feel and perceive and would I rather be right about all of that or would I rather be happy? And doing that and practicing that over and over whenever anything bothers you, anything irritates you, anything makes you upset. It's a very practical tool for forgiveness, for opening your mind to miracles. And, and yet underneath it, that, even that app and that uh, chatbot, it, all of it's aimed at one thing and that one thing is coming under Christ's control, is, is aligning your mind back with, with who you truly are, with the Christ. I'm not talking about a man or a woman, I'm talking about the Christ idea, a perfect idea in the mind of God. You know, we can let go of all the beliefs too around even through history, there's lots of beliefs around the Christ. Sacrificial beliefs and beliefs that, um, that somehow that God was punishing and that there had to be an ultimate Lamb of God sacrifice, the blood of the Lamb for the sacrifice, for the good of the rest of humankind. You know, there's a lot of beliefs that have been thrown on this beautiful Christ idea that have nothing to do with this beautiful Christ idea. And so that's what it means to start to come into alignment. And for me, I did have to let go of all my ideas of what my career would be, um, all my ideas of what the future would be, all my ambitions, all my goals, my life goals. Yeah, I had to let go of all of that. Um, I had to let go of being in control, even in control of the body. You know, when, when I had that kind of experience of like, Jesus, take it all, Holy Spirit, take it all, use it all for the glory of, of everyone, um, that, that took me out of the equation, the little mini-me of planning for the body and trying to figure out what was best for the body and what, which environment was the best, and you know, the typical things that people spend countless hours doing meaningless jobs that they don't even like in many cases, you know, to try to earn money, save money, invest money, build some kind of giant financial nest egg, and then after they've done all that, then usually they're just as confused as they were when they started. <laughs> Now they don't know, they don't even know what to do with the money. You know, how do I keep it? Where do I, where, where do I spend it? You know, when the mind's confused, it's just, it's in a state of not knowing. And it's, it just needs a lot of help. It needs a lot of guidance. It needs, it needs wisdom. It, it really needs wisdom, really divine wisdom to, to come and to to show it what's, what's valuable, what's important. On a, on a day to day, on a moment by moment basis, you know, that's what being under Christ's control is all about. And then the more, I think the more you get into this, the more you dive into it, it does your life, as you've known, it seems kind of surreal. It seems kind of like, sometimes you get the feeling that it's like, it's a fiction novel. It's like, it's like you're watching a surreal fiction novel and you're thinking, I can't figure this thing out at all. Well, that's actually good. Your mind is starting to loosen from judging things, from trying to be the, the critic, you know, and, and always coming in with a harsh judgment. You should do more of this or you should be better at this or look at that person over there. 
you know, the, the ego mind, is, all it does is it judges non-stop. It's always comparing and criticizing. Do I measure up? Am I good enough? Um, am, I, am I loved enough? Uh, it just goes on and on. Could things be better? Oh, it, oh, I like that over there. Oh, no, it's over there. I like that. You know, it's very distracted. Um, it's kind of like a wild feather blowing in the wind. And it's just... From the ego's perspective, it's like at the mercy of some kind of ferocious wind. And you feel at times, when you follow the ego's thought system, you feel helpless. You feel, you feel at the mercy of, uh, of, of a vast world outside. And, and you feel so tiny and so small and so insignificant. And all of those feelings and all of those perceptions are, are sponsored by the ego to keep you enslaved to its belief system. It doesn't want you to know you're the Christ. It doesn't want you to be truly free and happy. If you truly know who you are, then the ego is out of business. The, the, the Christ is a state of mind that knows that God is, is a fact and Christ is a fact and there is nothing but the fact. There, there is nothing else but what is, is what uh, Byron Katie calls it. And so, technically, from that definition, the ego is out of business. It doesn't even, it will seem to cease to exist when you recognize who you are. You will no longer be at the mercy of it. Jesus even says in the Course, you made the ego by believing it, and you can dispel it by withdrawing your belief from it. And it also, Jesus also says, but the ego has no power to make you do things unless you give it power to do so. So the, the ego has no power over you, no power over your mind, unless, this is the big unless, you give it that power. You made the ego by believing in it, and you can dispel it by withdrawing your belief from it. So that's what we've got going on today. Here we are. It's an online retreat. We're all drawn together in a beautiful kind of a quantum, uh, giant quantum uh, classroom where we're all together. We're all together in the same realm of teaching and learning. And it seems the bodies are sprinkled all over the world, but that really is immaterial and irrelevant. We're all together, and we're all together to start to realize that the ego has no power over us unless we give it the power. Unless we invest in it, unless we follow it and believe in it, it we can unplug from the ego. You know, it's like, it's like, uh, It's like if the old days of computers, the early days of computers, you know, MS-DOS and all these things at the very beginning. If you, if you ended up getting a virus on your hard drive, then what all you had to do is hit this one instruction in the MS-DOS system, which was called wipe disk. All you have to do is hit wipe disk. And that whole virus is, is gone because the whole disk drive is wiped clean. So imagine that your consciousness is like a hard drive and all you're trying to do is trying to find the wipe disk <laughs> instruction, which is the spirit, which is the correction, which is the reinterpretation. It's going to wipe away everything that you seem to have learned, but it will leave you in bliss. It will leave you in, in limitless happiness and joy and freedom because everything that has been learned has been learned of the ego. You don't, if you're a perfect being and created by God, what do you need learning for? You're created perfect. What, what would you possibly need learning for? Well, now we find a situation where we've dreaming of time and space and we've had, Jesus says, you've overlearned an impossible lesson. What's that? What do you mean, Jesus? I've overlearned an impossible lesson. Well, the ego is an impossible lesson, and you've overlearned it. 
you've practiced this idea of separation in your mind so completely, so meticulously, that you forgot about innocence. You forgot about I amness. You forgot about joy from overlearning an impossible lesson. How do you deal with this world except, first of all, to listen to what Jesus says is that it's an impossible situation and then even if it's an impossible situation but you believe in it, you believe it's possible, then he's saying, that's fine, then we just have to have a reinterpretation. We need to get a, we need a wipe disk <laughs> to come in here and let's do a reset button. Let's just reset this computer. Let's reset this mind. Let's reset this consciousness back to a state that doesn't involve judgment anymore. Judgment was the problem. That was the teachings in the Bible. Judge not, lest you be judged. Judgment's the problem. Forgiveness is the escape from judgment. And that's the solution. And that's the wipe this. That's, that's the reset button. So, this is why we come together to talk about this. And this is why we have these interactive online uh, retreats. And th this is why we actually encourage you to write out your questions. Because if I have time, I love to actually delve right into the, the pages of questions that you've written out. You've just poured it out from your heart. Like, this is what I'm dealing with. This is. This is my particular predicament that I'm dealing with here. And this is where I'm struggling, so I would like to start from where I'm struggling and move in the direction of, of the Christ control. So, as I always do at these, <laughs> these mornings, I come to a point where I say, okay, that's my spiel. <laughs> that's, my, that's my Christ spiel for the morning, my... my Christ extension, and then let's just open it up and let's come together in this, because we have to come together at a meeting point of saying, I am willing to move in the direction of that correction, of that reinterpretation, and I would like to examine something that's right in my face at the moment, or that, that I'm dealing with the most at this moment, so that we can, I can loosen a bit from it and continue on my journey towards, towards the healing, towards the wholeness. So, Jeff, why don't we open it up initially and we'll see how this goes. I've still got these questions here, but I, I would like to uh, just do some direct, live interactions on what we've just talked about in terms of freeing the mind. Sounds good. Um, first up would be um, Real Teresa. Thank you. Hi. Um, yeah, thank you so much, David. Um, I really appreciated everything that you said because it, um, yeah, it just really reminded me of, um, yeah, that uh, there actually is a lot going on underneath the surface um, here. And um, yesterday, I, I felt so full of joy and, um, and bliss, really, just being in everyone's presence here. And, um, but um, near the end, um, I had this full-on reaction happening and... Um, um, it was when you were talking about um, all the Kiwis, you know, in New Zealand getting together and, and you know, um, Kirsten's coming and, and I was getting so excited because um, I really want to join up. And then um, um, somehow my name didn't get mentioned and I took that as a, like one of my issues is this deep, deep sense of... Um, abandonment that I've noticed that it keeps coming up and um, so after the um, retreat I was just so angry and I could feel the heat rising and I've really really um, 
struggled throughout my life with this intense rage that seems to come up when, you know, um, I don't know, I get triggered by certain things. And, um, and I thought, oh, my God, I'm not going back to that retreat. I've had enough. I don't want to feel this uncomfortable. Why should I do this? Because, you know, I'm, I feel like I'm heading into the storm every time I go on a retreat or, you know, feel like um, I need to open up. And so I was so angry and I thought, oh, my God, I can't go back. And all these attack thoughts were coming up. So... Um, but the pain of it, of just feeling that separation, seems to be getting more and more intense. Um, because I've got no other options. I, I feel like there's no other way I can deal with these feelings anymore. I've kind of used up all my options. So um, I have to contact someone. So I... I I did that and told them what was really going on and how I felt. And, you know, it was like this intense feeling of if the world, I've had enough, I can't deal with it. I hate the world. I don't fit in here. The whole lot was coming up from this stupid, pitiful, like, thing. And I had to um, laugh about it at the end because I realized I got the whole thing all mixed up because you mentioned something about a Facebook group got together and, and I was like, what Facebook group? How come I'm not part of it? And, and you know, it was just hideous. It was pathetic really in the ego sense. But um, the, I just noticed I really, really had this problem with this rage coming up and um I mean I'm I'm really happy that I um contacted my friend and and you know I kind of laughed about it in the end but um that seems to be a real big um thing for me is this feeling of abandonment and not feeling good enough and I'm not part of it you know, wherever I go, I just feel like the odd one out. Um, and so my way has always been to either attack or hide. And, um, I mean, I was just sharing about I got myself into many dangerous situations because of this rage. I can laugh about it now, but at the time like being pulled up by the police when I'm driving and I'm in some sort of rage, standing up to guys that are twice the size of me and telling them, you know, what I think of them. And it's just kind of crazy. Um, and nobody really believes me when I tell them because I don't look like the kind of person that would do that. But I was sort of wanting to look at, that because I it's like I go unconscious um when I'm triggered if I don't catch it quick enough it's all this terrible stuff comes out of my mouth and um it's like what the hell what you know um where exactly is this coming from it's um Obviously, it's not my Christ mind because um, it's completely out of control. And since I've been doing the course, I'm going through the um, the course first time round pretty much. And to me, the whole thing is it's incredible. You know, um, when I'm reading it, I just feel like, my God. Jesus is in my head, you know, he understands what's going on. Um, but there's so much shame and guilt as well that comes with this reaction because partly it's to do with, you know, I'm a woman as well and I give myself a hard time that women aren't supposed to be like that. Um, you know, and I'm a mother and 
you know, you can't react like that when you have children and, um, but, um, to me, it, it feels like, um, in form, I keep, the same patterns keep coming up and I didn't realize, you know, until I started reading the course, actually, I'm the one that's, um, creating all of this but you know it's there for my healing but so I want to come out of that feeling of being a victim of life as if I have been abandoned and um yeah I just I want to be like you I mean mm -hmm. not and I don't mean in form but as in when you're talking about being guided and and you know not knowing where um your finances are coming from and and where you're going to go and you just want to spread the love and and you know that's how i feel and yet um the other day on facebook i mentioned something about um i i saw um like a picture of these horses running and um and it was so beautiful and it was so powerful. And yet I was one of the horses, like this, this black stallion on my hind legs and I was wanting to go, but I couldn't, I can't go because the reins are like being pulled back. And, and to me, it just feels like this intense feeling of frustration because on the one hand, I, feel this huge potential that I've always had and it feels so loving and pure and yet I've also got obviously the um, ego is like really raging and doesn't want me to move forward so you know I was wondering whether I was going to share about that because it feels kind of um, uncomfortable obviously to share about but I thought well maybe I'm not the only one that feels like that and um yeah I just I know that I have to open up to to that but um yeah so I just yeah I just really wanted to share that hmm. thank you Teresa thank you, Ter yeah it's very very it's common, common that uh, there's this unconscious mind that is, that is so dark and so full of rage and so full of hatred. It's very much like a volcano, you know, where on the top, you know, you see the mountain and you have the, the opening and the hole at the top and maybe it's been dormant and it's not uh, exploded for tens or hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of years, but but what you perceive on the surface is this mountain. So I've even got some trees and some growth on it. It looks like just pretty much like any other mountain, except when the smoke starts coming off of the top of the mountain. And then you go, oh, that's a volcano. That's not, that's not just a regular mountain, that's a volcano. And that's the way the mind is, that the mind is, it's got a self-concept, and the Teresa self-concept on, is on the surface, and if you, if you read deep enough into the Course, into the text, Jesus will, will talk about this. He talks about the self-concept is a two-tier self-concept. There's the face of innocence, which is the personality self. And he says, sometimes it's wet with tears at the injustices of the world. You know, like that stallion with all those horses, but the reins are being pulled back on that particular black stallion. And, and the stallion's rearing up, the, its, its front legs have gone up because it's, it's uh, not, not happy. It's, uh, it's being held back in some way. And, and, and then he says underneath the, the, the face of innocence is, is a self-concept so dark that it cannot even be looked upon. That's why the top tier, that's why the personality self was made so, so the mind wouldn't have to go down and look at the bottom part. And he uses the phrase in there, he said, this part is draped with sin. 
draped with sin. This is what Jesus says about the bottom part. He's trying to give us a clue about how dark and how intense. It's like that lava that's underneath that uh, volcano, that pool of lava, maybe a very thick pool of hot lava, maybe like 1600 degree lava that would just incinerate anything that the world knows if it came in contact with the 1600 degree uh, lava. That's how, that's how volatile the unconscious mind is. And then underneath this self two-tier self-concept is the Christ, is this magnificent love and light that uh, once the mind believed it separated, that's where these, the self-concept came in, because it believed it had guilt, it believed it separated from God, which really couldn't happen in reality, uh, but it believed it did, and it brought on itself like a, a whole world, a whole cosmos, a whole memory set of all these false memories, you know, you being the spunky little girl or woman that was talking to the guy that was twice as big, standing up and saying, just giving him what for, I'll tell you what I think and this and this, and then looking back on it and going, was I completely nuts? I, I mean, it's, it's amazing I'm alive uh, with the things that I've tried to pull, and these are coming from these unconscious urges and impulses. And there's one great line that I always like to quote from the Course, where Jesus says, until you look upon the full extent of your own self-hatred, you will not be willing to let it go. Oh, I'll go say that again. Until you're willing to look upon the full extent of your own self-hatred, you will not be willing to let it go. So, that's why the stage of the development of trust, that's why four of those six stages of learning to trust are difficult, is because that self-hatred is going to come in during this development of trust as an interference pattern. The ego is not just going to lie down and, and say, oh, okay, you're the Christ, you know, I'm no match uh, for that kind of power. Uh, you know, I just, just go ahead and trust and have all the miracles you want and uh, forget about me because I'm just a puff of nothingness. No, the ego never identifies itself as nothingness. In fact, to the ego, it's, oh, it's very real. And God is not real. Eternal love is not real. The ego laughs at the idea of heaven. Uh, and even if you're persistent and you keep saying, no, I know there is a heaven, then the ego said, well, I'm going to make the return to heaven as difficult as I can, if you dare to believe in that. I'm going to make it, I'm going to make your life hell, if you think you're going back to heaven. So, it's good that you're bringing this up, because I find, I feel like when we come together like this, we have a lifelong relationship dedicated to awakening. Part of that dedication is, is that there's going to be a lot of unconscious stuff that comes up. So, I've lived in a number of spiritual communities. Has rage come up? Every community I've been at, the rage comes up. Does it come up with individuals? It comes up for everybody. I've never met a single person where the rage didn't come up at some point. I mean, if I, we lived in community, we were there long enough facing things on a day-to-day -day basis, so, yeah, you have nothing to be, feel awkward about. In fact, it, it's very courageous of you to, to bring up this topic, because I, it is a topic that touches on for everyone. And it's also a way that the ego uses saying, oh, you can't be raging because you'll be completely rejected, nobody will want to be around you, and if they find out about any of these rage episodes, they, they'll disown you, they won't want to be near you. If they find out, oh, you're a mother, oh, you're a raging mother, oh, raging mother, you know, they don't, the ego has all kinds of defense, rejection, and then it says you need to isolate, which uh, Michael talked about last night, you know, how dangerous the isolation tendency is. But what you're doing is you're giving an example of your exposing and saying, this is what happened, 
And through the filter of, I call it inclusion exclusion, you know, the, the filter that says we've been, at times in the past, we could say we've been abandoned, rejected, we haven't been recognized for who we are. Even when we were children in school, why didn't they call my name? Uh, at, for, for games or projects, why didn't they pick me? Uh, adults carry the same kind of uh, abandonment, rejection issues, and, and inclusion, exclusion ex issues is what I call it. And we do face those pretty much every week in community. Uh, if you went to a, um, a, a series of Course in Miracles retreats, like I've been to so many Course in Miracles retreats all over the world, these are the kind of issues that come up when people are all sitting around in a circle. You know, this is the very things that people talk about because they want to be free from them. They know it's holding them back in some way. And really underneath it, they're just saying, do I even have permission to allow some of these repressed unconscious feelings up? Because I think that's the only way I'm going to heal, is to allow them to come more toward the surface. And it's true. So um, it's very much um, a part of things. I mean, over the years too, when these kind of rage feelings come up, sometimes they're acted out and then there's a lot of shame. If the body acts out the, the rage feelings, um, then there's usually intense guilt that comes. Almost like a feeling of, oh, now it's, now I've, I've kind of let it out of the bag and now people can see who I really am. It's really all just the ego. But once you allow these feelings up, that's the first step towards, uh, towards releasing them. And we also learn from the Course that, that a little irritation, minor irritations and, and minor annoyances, Jesus says, are a thin veil drawn over intense fury. So for most humans, and even most psychologists, they would say, yeah, there's a big difference between rage and annoyance. One is very serious, the other one's, eh, it's an everyday occurrence, you know, it's, it's to be accepted. And Jesus is saying, no, both are part of the same thread that keep you from peace of mind. So that's the beginning of a spiritual evolution where you start to realize that there are no small upsets. That any upset, even the most minor upset, is, is keeping me from knowing the true peace and the true happiness that I am. So we shouldn't judge ourselves when these uh, emotions start to, to come to awareness. Uh, even in relationships, I mean, if you talk to most people and if you ask people, a bunch of single people, why are you single, they might say, hey, listen, I'm a handful to handle by myself. Don't, don't put me in the same uh, house or apartment with another human being. They might say, I don't do good with pets. I mean, I, I have uh, authority issues with my past pets. My past dogs and my cats don't, don't put a human being in the same room with me or the same house because I'm volatile. Uh, I, I tend to wear my heart on my sleeve. I'm, I, 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 I bring my emotions to the surface and then I get these wild, crazy projections back that think I'm accusing them or I'm pointing the finger at them when I'm just exploring <laughs> my own my own psyche, my own emotions coming up, and they're taking it very personally as if like I'm attacking them. And so you see why for us to do the Course, which is such a direct pathway to God, Spirit, and to, the Course is a, a Course that uses relationships and actually says, no, we can actually use them in a helpful way to heal. You don't have to go hide away in a cave and you don't have to hide away in the forest, you can actually use your relationships and we can learn to make better decisions as we release these, these dark emotions. So I think it's very courageous what you're doing and I actually feel it's very healthy. 
it's a very good witness for everybody to see because this is everybody can relate to this there's not a single person watching is participating on this online retreat that cannot relate to what you're talking about everybody can can relate at some level and it's also an invitation to say that's why we're doing this because we have to be able to talk about those things instead of just trying to judge ourselves as wrong for having that emotion and stuff it back down without uh, even giving it a space to move through so it's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa, for your gift. You, give, you just gave us all a huge gift there. And I might mention about that Facebook group. Uh, in the old day, when people would suggest ideas to me or write to me, they would, they would send me an email and I would, I would CC them and everybody else I thought about that I thought might be interested in such a thing. Or uh, I would just hit CC and anybody in my um, address book that would come up that I would feel might be part of that, I would just include it. But nowadays people don't send me as many emails, so they, so they use Facebook Messenger, among many other things, WhatsApp and you know, all these different things. So it was me who, who thought of a few people initially in, in New Zealand, the woman who contacted me who said she had this house available to use for spirits purposes and then a few people uh, in the vicinity of um, of Auckland that came to mind so it was it was one of those Facebook messenger groups not a, a typical Facebook group it was me putting their name and a few people I think maybe two or three or four at the most I think I put Kirsten's name in there and and a few others and then sending it out and then it goes however it goes. I kind of send it out to, to the universe. So that was what the, it was actually a Facebook messenger group, was just a seedling group to start the idea. And then, um, yeah, where it goes from there, I, I sometimes see responses and go back in there and sometimes if I'm guided, but, so that gives you the more of the context of, of how that happened. <laughs> There was no specific intention to include, exclude Teresa. There was no intention whatsoever in there. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, up next is uh, Sandos Cassier. Go ahead, Sandos. happy to be here. Um, it's my first time and I just found out about you, David, not too long ago. Um, I've been a student of the Course in Miracles. Uh, I started back in uh, 2002 and um, um, was very um, happy and intrigued about it. Um, I, I guess I, I had suffered uh, countless traumas and whatnot, and, and I have ADD, and so I, I was never able to finish anything. And my first book that I ever read, and I was able to finish it cover to cover, was uh, Marianne Williamson's book, Return to Love. And, um, and I loved the concept of, of The Course in Miracles. It just resonated into, into um, my heart. And... Um, I have jotted down some of the things um, that I struggle with, and um, um, I have um, endured um, countless um, um, traumas. I was born in Baghdad, Iraq, and um, and so um, my traumas began from. The moon. Um, my mom tried to award me three times and countless abuse, the three abuses and whatnot. So, um, and then my another trauma before I was age six, and I went through many therapy and um, even went to school of social work, got a master's degree in social work, cognitive behavioral therapy, trying to. I know you said that that's the worst thing we can do is go through the um, 
educational aspect because that actually gets in the way um, of healing. Nonetheless, it has caused, a, I have a lot of inner conflicts, distraction, avoidance, dissociation. I've developed addiction. I will have 10 years of sobriety from alcoholism next month. Um, but it seems like the addiction kind of goes from one thing into another. I've developed playing stupid games on the phone, lack of focus, procrastination, um, fear, um, just, and, and my biggest dream, and I, a lot of times I, I, I wanted to, to write, that was my biggest dream, is to write. I love Jesus from with all my heart. I guess throughout the trauma and whatever, I always found myself as a child, I would go on top of the roof back in Baghdad and I would just go up there and look at the skies and I knew there has to be a different way. There has to be a different way. Because I grew up with three different religions and every single one thought that they were superior and they were the way. Even though I grew up as a Christian, we were persecuted and whatnot. But as if now, you know, I always loved, loved, loved. But now that I saw the beheadingness that was happening in Iraq, I developed hate toward the Muslims because of what's happening. So I, there's a lot of stuff that's happening. So, um, and then the, to top it all off, my daughter, my firstborn daughter, I, I've always been about peace and love. I named my first daughter, Dunya means the world, in three languages. Shayna is the second daughter, means beautiful in Hebrew. And my son is Sabian negotiable. My first daughter took her own life almost eight years ago, and she was my Christmas baby. So I stopped doing the course. I just picked it up back again. I'm on lesson 53. So, but it's still hard for me to celebrate Christmas. I go into deep depression, I isolate, and I journal all the time. This is my journal. I want to be at your command. I want to be under your control, Jesus. That's my prayer. And when I saw that workshop you have, I'm like, I want that more than anything. Mm -hmm. I want that more than anything. And there's not a thing that I want more than being under Jesus' control. There's not a one thing. But there's a lot of stuff that gets in the way. It's not easy. It really isn't easy. Well, it's so beautiful, Sandos. I, I just, I feel your heart, and I'm so glad you signed up for this uh, weekend retreat. And I would just say, uh, as we start to have a real understanding of what works and what doesn't work, uh, today is the first day of the, the rest of your life. Uh, I'm going to give you a very direct shot uh, to God. Uh, it's kind of like in the Matrix movie. Did you ever see Matrix? Uh, many times, yeah? Well, when, uh, when um, Neo first gets the phone call from Morpheus, Morpheus says to him very directly, I can guide you, but you must do exactly as I say. And Neo is like, what, now? He says, yes, stand up. Do it slowly. I mean, he goes, Morpheus starts with him right where he stands in that cubicle with the phone in his hand and immediately begins the instructions of, of a more direct shot to God. The curriculum I'm teaching is like advanced, 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 advanced Course in Miracles. This stuff is, this is way beyond the course groups, way beyond the course conferences, way beyond most retreats, this is like the kingdom of heaven, like let's join together, let's join forces here. If that's your prayer of your heart, if you want to be under Christ's guidance and Christ's control, you've come to the right place, because that's what this is precisely about. Even the, the tools, for me, I've, I've started the course in 1986, and in, in uh, getting it in California and taking it back to Cincinnati, Ohio. But I went so, I mean, I read it eight hours a day for the first two and a half years, using it as an oracle, having mystical experiences, diving down, way down into the light, into the deep end at the beginning. And then 
it got so mystical that I would say everything that's unfolded since then has, I'm doing everything backwards. When you, when you develop a career, you're supposed to go to school, then you get your job, then you get better jobs, you climb the ladder, you work your way up, maybe you write some books or do some talks and seminars and this and this and get and make a name for yourself and blah blah blah. Everything is backwards. I'm a mystic where all the things that seem to be associated with me aren't really what I'm about. I'm about just listening to Jesus and following Jesus every day with every single step and nothing is excluded. All the traumas that you mentioned, childhood traumas, abortion attempts, childhood traumas at six years old, everything that you've gone through, it just gives you a, an experience where you can say, well, I, I'm getting clearer and clearer of what I don't want as an, as an experience. You know, that this world that's played out for the first so many years, this is showing me clearly what love is not. And it's like the Eastern path of neti neti. You're getting lots of neti neti, not this, not this, not this. You're starting to see there are things that, that don't make sense, the superior, the inferior ideas, theologies that kind of point fingers at each other, or who's right and which is the best way, craziness. Um, and also experiences that are very painful, psychologically painful, physically painful. Then you start to realize, well this is, this is the basis of, of what can't be the truth. You know, and then you pick up a book like The Course, and The Course is not, is not going to uh, be a path of compromise. I mean, when you get to the workbook in A Course in Miracles, and Jesus says, if God is real, there is no pain. And if pain is real, there is no God. That is a direct teaching from an enlightened mind that knows the reality of love, of the reality of joy. Many times we talk here that Jesus says, your mind is asleep, it's so confused, it can't tell the difference between pain and joy. Because if it could, the pain would be gone forever. So there's a, there's a very deep confusion and disorientation in the mind, and then we have tools like books and songs and movies with commentary. Uh, we have app for your iPhone, uh, Facebook thing. We've come up with so many direct tools that it would be like, like uh, if you went to the beach and somebody told you before, I want you to take up every grain of sand off the beach using just this one tool. It's the little tweezers. <laughs> You're going, I want clear the beach for miles with the tweezers. And you go, yeah, right. That's how most humans feel. They feel like they're clearing the beach with the tweezers. And, and actually, they don't have a very good tool in their hand. There are some amazing, amazing tools that collapse time, that shorten the distance to the wake up. Uh, and they're just the most spectacular kind of tools because of their time saving uh, ability. And those are the kind of things that you are now just beginning to come into. Because you'll find that there are things that you actually enjoy about this world, that you are, have a, a, an interest in, that the Spirit will use those things that you're actively interested in to help you unwind from everything that you believe about this world. And also I have to say, the, the camaraderie, the fellowship, the mighty companions you meet along the way, I remember reading the course at one point. I did it all on my own for quite a while, and then um, I remember reading that part in the course where Jesus said, you will not go on alone from here. Mighty companions go with you. I didn't know what that was at the time when I read it, but I did have a feeling like, thank you. Thank you, I need help. I need, I need many more symbols, many more accurate tools that, that can s slice through the, the darkness and, and help let more light in, uh, into my awareness. So, so it's beautiful, and, and I would say that 
everything that you've described, the best way to look at it is, okay, that's just, that's just my life as I saw it. Today is the first day of the rest of my life and I am going to rise up. I am going to pull, wipe the sleep away from my eyes. I am going to lift the blinders off. I am going to hold my hands up and say, take my hand. I, I know you are there. I want to feel an experiential sense of being helped. I don't want to feel like it's a hit or miss, like I'm, I'm, sh I'm in the dark, just stabbing for any, grasping for any bit of help I can get in the dark. I want to actually have a, a concerted, full experience of help, of being helped. That's what this is all about. You're, you're hitting the nail on the head. This is the, that's the core of, of what this whole thing is about. And I'm just so grateful that you, you introduced yourself and you came and joined in because now, yeah, there's about 80 some people that are, are smiling along with you now and, and going, oh, my new friend Sandos, oh, I, I, now I see you. You're in my awareness now. You're part of uh, the movement of awakening in a very strong, clear way. So thank you. Thank you, Sandos. Thank you. Beautiful. Ah. Hmm. Next person with their hand up is uh, Jimmy Doherty. Go ahead, Jimmy. Oh, you can hear me, right? Hi there, we see you. Okay, David, 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 David. I've been waiting so long. Um, I just, I met you a few times and it's been like, and it was when you're talking about all the, how, what you're providing is much deeper. And what I'm much interested in is the Gestalt. I know Andy, Nicholas, and Jason, I've been in one of your satellites around, but the, the process that you go through acts like mirrors to each other. The relationships are just function catalysts yeah. of mirrors. And I think that's a very, needed process to reveal everything that's inside yourself and, that, and like we constantly it's disturbing to people because good stuff comes up bad stuff comes up this comes up whatever comes up got to come up whatever's going to come up is not real and we got to get to what's unreal to get to what we are and uh, I, don't, I, I started you're very funny to me in the sense that I started in 87 so I feel like this really irresponsible, neglectful dilettante with the course, you know what I mean? I always say like, if it, I always use the analogy, I was talking to Andy, the opening of the Monkees TV show where they run up to the water and they run back, they run back. That's always me with the course. I have breakthroughs and wonderful moments and I know God's there, but you know, it, it's so quickly, like I was just thinking about a second, so much in a second in an ego's mind can go this way or that way that you have to be so disciplined if you want the peace of God. And I wanted to say something else, like every, the great Robert Frost poem, uh, 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 A Road Less Travel. Oh yeah. And for years and years, people thought like, he took this hard road. He took the road that was less traveled. And he says, that was the easier road. It's the easier road. I didn't go climbing, I didn't go up Everest. I just took this shortcut. It was the easy road. Nobody goes there. I went there. My life, was, I was a poet. I did what I wanted to do. People love, you know, it was an easier road. And that's what Christ is trying to tell us. It's really the easier road. Yeah. We, okay, we got to go up Everest. We got to go up. Yeah, there's always this dramatic kind of climb or something the ego pulls us into. Yeah. So, I'm very interested in coming out with the communities. I'm a teacher and I'm in the matrix. I am deep in the matrix. I go to the subway every day in New York City and I think about Neo when he was trapped in the matrix and he's in the, 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 the controller was there and he couldn't get out of that subway station. It's so remarkable that at 710 every morning, I'm in the same station at the same spot with some of the same homeless people same thing, and this is this station. Neo station was a lot cleaner. This is like, you know, if you're looking at the depressing end of the world, 
it's um you know it, it's really coming up but it's like did anything happen between the last second and this thing here i am again here i am again i'm right in this kind of like drama of what you know kreutz is trying to tell us the other thing i wanted did you ever read um i don't know where i'm going but i sure ain't lost no, I've never. 86. You said 86. Is that popular? Okay. Well, that was like the first, that was my lead into the course. I read that book and it was exposing a lot about, you know, playing simple games. You compete. Competition is, is an attempt to kill the other person. It's just like, a, you know, but we're all doing this with the ego. The other thing I thought what you thought well, might be funny because we're always talking about stuff is that when I was doing this, I, I picked up that book. And this is about about a year before I hit the course. The course came to me. Was um, and this is very uh, insightful about the course. Is I was looking for positive messages. I was a comedian. I wanted to get my act together, and nothing wasn't working right. And I looked at this poster, and it was Charlie Brown in a classroom, and on the board said, "Education prepares you for tomorrow," and his head's on the table on the desk and he's thinking, I'm not even ready for today. And that's kind of like the dilemma, a humorous dilemma that Christ is pointing out to us. Like, you know, there is no tomorrow, there is no yesterday, there's no planning, and it's a very, very hard thing to release from ourselves. It's just, it's so inherently part of this game. And like, what I really suffer from is sometimes like when we, when you were talking about I went to the big reunion. I met you, and you've been getting away from me. The next day, you were gone. You blew back to Mexico, and, I, and I've been chasing you around, but I'll get you. I'll get you. <laughs> um, is, where was I going? I'm forgetting my thought now. We were there. Oh, the, the spectacle. When we come together with the conferences, it's very positive, and it, you sit there, and it's like a spring, and it, it pushes you down, pushes you down. Then I'm ready to explode, and what the court where we have to get to is that steady assurance and guidance of Christ where it's not up or down I have pro I have negative emotions but I also have trouble with positive like it's like I, I have this uranus electrical thing where soon I go up here but I got to manage all that so it's it's part of the same paradigm of the ego and I kind of want the pendulum kind of to get still and trustful enough that I'm not doing it you know what I mean? It's very, very stinky. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, God bless everybody. I love you, David. Uh, you know, and you took the shortcut, buddy. You took the road less travel. I'm, <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm up here. I'm at a high altitude. It's not working out. But I might make my way back to that fork in the road and, and get with you. Love you. Yeah. Thank you, Jimmy. Thank you. Thank you. I love that poem. Yeah. I, I, that, that hit me so many years ago. I, I thought I want to go on that road less traveled when I read that poem. So I love your joy and your passion. And uh, yeah, we're going to, we'll kind of connect one of these spots here in the world. Thank you. <laughs> beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful. Oh, we have another raised hand, and this time it's Anna. Go ahead, Anna. Hi, how are you? Hi, Anna. Hi, David. Um, the question that you asked yesterday, what's stopping you, kept on and on in my mind all through the night. And I couldn't find anything, really, that's stopping me for the first few hours. It was like, there's nothing really there that's stopping me. Why am I not letting go? And suddenly, the, the, the word routine came into mind. Um, all these weekly appointments, all these workshops, all these things that keep like unraveling one after the other without really thinking about it. It just seems to be the way to go. But then the more people that come in, the more people I see, the less time I have to spend um, with, with myself with Jesus so even though I'm there joining with somebody else's mind in spirit and wanting um, 
is openness and, and, and the guide to come in, it, it doesn't seem enough. I'm, I'm not quite sure what, what isn't working or, or, or what is it that, um, at one point I thought, well, maybe I should stop all that and just sit and reread the course over and over again until it sinks in and then I can be free. Um, and, and yes, why not? But um, then, then how do I do it? And, and all this thought process starts um, coming up. How do I do it? I stop seeing people, um, gradually letting them go, um, leaving the workshops and, 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 and all that, and, and having the time to go inward, um, just silently. It's like, I need that time. So, yeah, it, it's like confusing, but the truth is there's nothing really stopping me. But I still can't <laughs> um, let go of, of, of everything. So if, if yeah. I can just, I don't know, um, see the light in me <laughs> and help it come up, be recognized so that I can... Um, really get in there and, and yeah yeah well you know i think um sometimes it it helps with the examples so <clears throat> if we look at for example a course of miracles the the first two course of miracles students on the planet were helen shuckman and bill thedford eminent research psychologists top of their field um uh, wrote papers, were very, very well respected. In fact, developed, worked on a personality test that was so accurate it, it could uh, even predict uh, terrorism characteristics in, in certain individuals. It was, the most, it was an amazing thing. They were just top of their field. And then, um, and then this book comes and, and wow, it gives them a clue of, of what the higher purpose is of, uh, behind everything. You know, so they're going from eminent research psychologist to, okay, here it is, top of the line. Uh, this is top of the line. This is like your top non-dual teaching right in their language, using educational terms, psychology, even in English. You know, it comes right in as an answer to their prayer. There must be a better way. And then as they go through it, you know, the, they had to face the course. I think for Helen, it was, it was hard. It, it, uh, the rest of her lifetime, she did, one time she was quoted as saying, um, uh, I know the Course is true, I just don't believe it. Uh, very, for a woman that was so articulate to say something like that, it just cut right through all the words and concepts that she, her, her mind was having a great difficulty um, completely yielding to where this was going. I mean, they. Bill and Helen, they, they weren't into metaphysics, uh, but they were after the Course. They got into Edgar Cayce, they got into, Jesus used a lot of the metaphors of past lifetimes and, and things, which were not in their uh, research psychologist uh, mindsets. So even when they were working with the Course for those years, that was a huge expansion. And then, interestingly enough, the one that really uh, decided to, had to keep expanding, which is what you're really praying for right now. You're, you're praying, what, what is it that I need to see, that I need to really expand and accelerate uh, this expansion in a huge way, is what your prayer is. It came a time where Bill actually uh, left New York City, and, and that was a big move because of the professional life and, and and the, his whole life was New York City. It's like a like a fish in in a fishbowl. Um, to get out of that fishbowl was huge. So he moved out to uh, Northern California to be closer to uh, Judy Scutch and Jerry Jampolsky and a lot of the the very famous writers, transpersonal psychologists, and and very expansive thinkers out on the West Coast. And that was a big move there. And then after a number of years out there, he left there too. He left that whole group. He left all the, the beginning group uh, with the course 
and uh, all of his dear friends, and they lived very close within walking distance of Jerry and, and Judy and all of them. And, and then he moved to uh, Southern California because he went down to, to live with the Lucketts. A lot of people don't even know who the Lucketts are, but they were two people that worked with the Course with such passion and such a fervor that they actually introduced the Course all over the world. They traveled the world. He was retired uh, from the military, and Eulalia, when I first met her, I'd never seen a woman so joyful. She was flowing around with a, like a purple dress on, and I was walking down. What are these people doing? They were walking people down to the creek beds of Sedona to do baptisms, and this woman swooped up beside me and gave me a big kiss. I'd never I'd even met her before. She kissed me on the cheek before I knew what hit me. That was Eulalia. Eulalia and Jack were like taking the course so much deeper in an experiential way, beyond the professional, beyond the intellectual, to exploding kind of a joy. That was the presence that emanated from Eulalia. So Bill left Judy and Jerry and all of them up there to go live with the Lucketts. And then that was a part of him where he, he actually would go to course groups, but he wasn't seeing people. He wasn't seeing, like you're, you're seeing quite a lot of clients. He wasn't seeing clients. He would go to course groups and he would, he would sit there. He would hardly speak at these course groups. And yet he was one of the first two course students in the whole world. He, somewhere in his mind, he just decided, I'm going to go all the way with this course because the course itself says this course will be believed entirely or not at all. He read that line in there, this course will be believed entirely or not at all. And, and then the Luckets were so, so spontaneous, so free-spirited. I mean, they, they took it down. They had their course groups in San Diego and La Jolla, down, down in that area, San Diego area. But they, they took it down, down, down so deep. And now they, even they're still alive today. I think they're probably in the uh, upper 80s, around 90, living in, uh, on the Big Island, or not, uh, on the, uh, in Honolulu, on, on Oahu, uh, in Hawaii. But Bill, Bill's journey was interesting because he went with the Course beyond his, his, his professional identity, beyond his identity as a Course whatever, teacher, facilitator, whatever, he took it so to core, to the core of, I'm going to watch my mind every single moment. And I, I can guarantee you that he had those experiences as well, where he, it was like an unwinding and an unraveling from the routines that he was actually quite good at. He was, and I think you're probably very, very good at what you do, and you've been doing them for a long time, and, and there's like a, there's a competency uh, and, a, and an integrity to be able to give yourself over and work with clients that way. And I know Bill did that too with his life, although he, he was like a, a professor afraid of professing. He, he always put himself more in administrative positions, Jesus said, because he was afraid of the intimacy of that uh, connection of teaching. He thought to teach was to weaken. And Jesus had to work with him for years about loosening that false association. So I feel like, um, I, I think if you haven't read it yet, maybe, uh, maybe getting a copy uh, of uh, Carol Howe's book on, on Bill Thedford's life. Uh, because I think, I think it's, was it Never Forget to Laugh or something like that? I, I believe is the name of it. Um, it's so good. And I think Bill would be a real good kind of role model, and that by watching what he went through in the context of his life as one of the first two course students, you'll be able to glean a lot of things because there's a lot of parallels between your life and, and his life in that way. You know, he did have to transcend the, the professional self-concept at some point, and I'm sure it was very uncomfortable for him um, those moves away from New York City and then the moves to uh, 
Southern California with the Luckets. Those were big moves, and I think those were part of, of his guidance for kind of unwinding out of that, uh, that helper um, self-concept. So I think that'll be very, very helpful for you. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Okay, okay, David, we have about four minutes left. Do you feel, is it time for one more? Yeah, I think we can go with them one more here. Great. Next up is um, um, Helena Elias. Go ahead, Helena. Hi, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I think what I want to share that's tough for me is how the ego sounds so spiritual. And I think, um, because I don't want to make steps without the spirit guiding me. Um, and there is that desire. I think even that sometimes can be a block, like, <clears throat> like I need to be certain. Um, and yeah, like, the spirits guided me to a parent program, which feels actually supportive because it's unwinding me from the role in a sense and bringing more independence to them and kind of cutting some of the cords. And then I hear ego like, <clears throat> or it feels like that's not spontaneous. Like creating schedules isn't spontaneous. And these are just some examples of whenever I sort of get guidance or start to follow the guidance, a lot of doubt comes in and yet it sort of uses course lessons or course terminology. Um, so it can get very confusing and I start to create, get, it gets doubtful. Maybe I start to procrastinate or feel like I don't know anymore. What's the direction. And um, so that's kind of going on and um, yeah, just how, what to do what's practical with that like with the spiritual ego like constantly getting in there and wanting to take control and um create doubt or even when it comes to like symbols external symbols i know sometimes the spirit tries to guide and direct through symbols um even that can get sometimes confusing like for example, there's been measles going around town and Danny's like, we need to get vaccinated for measles. And I'm like, okay, is that guidance? Is that, you know, so there's a prayer like show me and then I'll, I'll keep getting mixed messages. Like I got to work and there's a book on the table the very next day that says vaccines are actually maybe unnecessary and not helpful. And, um, you know, there's this big debate about vaccines and then I'm like, oh, okay, is that it? And then, you know, Danny will, you know, send the message of we need to get them. And so I'm just like, ah, oh, sometimes it gets very confusing to understand even what the guidance is in that way. Like there's mixed messages through symbols and people. And um, so with the confusion on the guidance, what is practical? What do you recommend? Because I truly in my heart don't want to delay. And it's like, that seems to be what tends to get in the way and delay me is this spiritual ego um, also trying to guide me. And it sounds spiritual at times or the symbols get confusing. And I'm just like, ah. Yeah, beautiful. Well, well Helen, I think you're hitting a really key point on this whole retreat about under Christ's control because, because I would have to say if there's one thing or one factor that will be strengthened through all of this, and it can seem very confusing at times, it's, it's prayer. It's a purification of the prayers. It's like Jesus talked a little bit about with Helen Shuckman, you know, every single decision that Jesus and the Holy Spirit will guide you with is all really just about one thing, aside from the obvious things like the lesson of forgiveness or miracles or whatever, but it's about saving time. And even Jesus working with Helen Shuckman, like she said, I really need a coat. I want, I want Borgana coat. Uh, 
I, it has to be used because I only pay so much money. And she just got really in touch with what she wanted and what she needed, even in a specific way. And then would really give it to Jesus. And Jesus is like, okay, we're doing this for the good of the whole sonship, so we'll save time. I will guide you and direct you where in New York City to get that organic coat used and within the price range that you are willing to pay. That shows you how specific guidance can be and how, how prayer can be used in such an effective way, um, even with green pantyhose. Who, who, green pantyhose that fit this little lady in New York City? Uh, you got to be kidding me. You don't think Jesus is actually going to get involved with green pantyhose for Helen Shuckman. He, actually, yes. Uh, he told her where to go to get her green pantyhose. Why? That's bizarre. No, it isn't. It's not bizarre at all because it's a time saver. So I think what you're talking about is this is where, you know, when you did write your email, you, you were saying, I really want to, I've got attack thoughts going on. I want to connect with David. I want to connect with somebody in the community and everything. That's a good thing, I think, because those kind of situations come up where even when you're following guidance and you, you do get a strong feeling in one thing and you move forward with that guidance, the ego is so clever and so persistent at, at a, as a delay mechanism. It doesn't want you to save time for the whole universe. It wants you to it wants to delay your homecoming, so to speak, as long as it can, because that's its own self-preservation. And these are the things, you're making them there with your children, your, where you live with Danny, and so on and so forth. That's your context for making all these decisions. We go through those things as a community all the time. In fact, you know, this is, what you're bringing up is, we have a real strong focus right now in the community on prayer because it's, the more aligned it can be, the more centered it can be on praying, on pray first, and, and really pausing to focus on, on the prayer, what, what feels most helpful, really going in that direction, beyond the, the analysis of checking things out and you know how the ego always wants to check out past references and kind of plug it all into the equation to make its decision. Uh, we're really focusing on the prayer and the communication and the relationships right now. Those are the keys, the key focal points in, in the whole community. And so I do feel like what you wrote too about linking in and having a mechanism of linking in, especially when you get to those points where the ego is trying to hammer you in there, and and it seems like, like why you know I've made my decision. I I feel my leanings. I feel what I'm leaning toward, and then the ego is trying to like complicate the matter, and and that's always what it's going to do. It's always quite clever at trying to make it smoky, make it murky, uh, keep away from simplicity. You know, it always is trying to do that. So, I, I hear you. I, I hear that that's the prayer of the heart. So, with our connections and then even in connecting in with who you're guided to connect in with on a regular basis, I think that's, that's very much where you're at right now and that you just want your, it to be used the best use of time. You don't want to uh, be second-guessing yourself uh, with things and going around with these kind of clever ego shenanigans and g games, really, that are, that's all it really is. It's just an interference pattern. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. That's another key point. Thank you. Okay, well, that was fast. That, that two hours went by lickety-split. But, uh, we actually have a point right now, I mentioned it last night, where uh, I was talking about the one-on-ones, and uh, so we have some, some of those in the community that are really going to make themselves available during this, this uh, break time that we have coming up these next uh, couple hours. So if you use in your Zoom room, there is a chat box, and if you connect with Carolina, uh, who is part of all of us. She's, she's in there. 
and she's, she's standing by to take down your names and to try to uh, pair you up with someone in the community for, for one-on-ones. And uh, this is something we did way back at the beginning of uh, 2018. We actually took a break time in between uh, a couple of the sessions to really use it for one-on-ones. So it may be something that you've been feeling during the session or maybe something that you're curious about or something that you would want to carry on with, that you've just spoken with me or you've brought it up or you've heard it in the session and it started to trigger some things that you feel like you'd like to explore. So that is how you do it. You just connect in with Carolina and on, on the chat room and she will do her best right there. I see her. There she is. She's waving. <laughs> As I looked over there, we'll bring her up onto the screen. There's Carolina. And she is standing by. <laughs> when they say operators are standing by, it, in our case, it's Carolina is standing by to take on your one-on-one -on -one request. So thank you all from the bottom of my heart for today, for this session. And uh, I will be in prayer. I'm going to uh, talk with Jason and perhaps uh, Michael. We, we talked uh, briefly last night, but we're going to talk about the afternoon session to see what the Spirit is going to bring for us for in this uh, beautiful weekend retreat. So thank you all. Thank you for sharing this. It's been a great joy. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. See you soon. See you shortly. <laughs>